Uh, I want to welcome everybody. Please turn off your cell phones and we'll get started. Uh, I'm Stuart Wolpert, and in this series of UCLA Conversations, we're bringing you outstanding experts on important topics, and we certainly have that for you today. Uh, books have been banned more than 3,000 times in the United States this year. Librarians have been threatened and harassed. Many librarians have quit their jobs in multiple states. There are universities that have, have proposed deep cuts to the humanities. And today we're going to be talking about the state of the humanities, the importance of the humanities at UCLA and nationally. And we have the perfect speaker to do so. Um, David Scopper was dean of the humanities at UCLA for more than a decade, from 2011 to last year. He's a professor of Asian languages and cultures. His remarkable research is on early Chinese historical writing and literary analysis. And he combines distinguished mastery of Chinese, Greek, and Latin with deep knowledge of the primary historic, historical texts. And he analyzes them using the best and latest literary and critical theories. We're very fortunate to have with us David Scopper. Please join me in a warm welcome. Thank you, for doing it. Thank you everyone for coming out to, uh, to hear us talk a little bit about these past uh, 10 or well, years. You know, since we have the schedule, I've been looking forward to this one. I, I know it's such smart insights. Um, let's start with the importance of the humanities. The first thing I want to ask you is what should students who plan to become doctors, engineers, computer programmers learn about the humanities and why? Yeah, uh, to begin to, to think about this issue as we were preparing to, to, to talk for today, I went back to thoughts that, of course, I had throughout my, my time as dean. One is called on frequently to justify the humanities to people whose default position is, for whatever reason, not to look at the humanities, or regard it as a waste of time here on campus. And of course, I'm speaking about uh, undergraduate students in their most extreme kind of form. Uh, Many of you have probably been to the Humanities Welcome. That was an event designed to give incoming students and people who are already committing themselves to the Humanities a chance to think about what the Humanities would do for them while they're here at UCLA, whether they're here as engineers or as um, actors or dancers or humanists. And you know, some of the points that we made are really, I think, going to be valid going forward, whatever, whatever people are doing with their education after high school. They have to do with the way that humanities classes, at least as taught at UCLA, put you in a room with other people and require that you work together to understand some system of organized science, some artifact of human creation, almost inevitably separate from you in some way, historically, religiously, ethnically, you name your dimensions. That artifact will come from a separate place, and we'll sit here together in the humanities classroom and we'll work together. And I think the implicit ideal rarely achieved, but usually in the room with us when we do that, is that we'll arrive at a place where we can understand it together. And then we'll be, we will have done that without uh, letting some person sit, sit out there saying, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to restate this. We'll do that together, this interpretation of a text, uh, an artwork, a piece of music. And we'll do it together, ideally, in such a way that all of us will come together in an interpretation, in a reception of this artifact that we can carry together. Another point I'm trying to put here is that that requires that every one of us here, students and faculty, can get through this session without feeling, must I raise my hand now to correct a point of fact or a point of justice? I think there we get to something that's more and more part of our, our scene at UCLA. And that's the question of how we teach with justice in the classroom. And then I come back to the original question. I think what humanities does is allow us to sit together uh, at a crucial point in our lives and think hard together and come up against that edge of disagreement and see how we do with it. And there's a separate point which isn't quite so political as that, and that's the joy of interpretation. Um, we sometimes imagine that college humanities, that what's being taught and financially supported at the college level is the humanities. Let's think ourselves just a little bit and realize that what goes on in the comments on YouTube videos, um, 
is the humanities in some sense. Uh, the addictive consumption of TikTok videos is also the humanities in some sense. It may involve very little in the way of interpretation, but it's still a vision of a social group consuming things together and working out relationships around, uh, around that consumption. So I think these are some of the things that are in the scene when we teach humanities at the college level. All of these students have very rich and complex cultural lives, political lives, personal lives that extend far beyond the classroom, but it's in the classroom that we sit together and we try the pleasure, the glory of thought together. When it works right, as many of us who are faculty members know, when it works right, there is a palpable joy to it. And it's not just us feeling joy that it, but less well taught. It's a shared that was a very practical answer. Uh, so I'll we'll come back. <laughs> when you had written year, uh, several years ago, and this is a paraphrase, something along the lines that when you're dealing with professional people, who have nothing to do with the humanities, an accountant, a doctor, an engineer, you still would like them to know something about Shakespeare, something about Bach, something about great art. Yeah, yeah I mean, to, to put it as something that I would like, that we as, as university faculty would like, is, is one thing. I think the stronger version is that it's something I observe that everyone I encountered in you know, public related work, you know, Dean spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill, or in development work, talking with people about supporting things within the university. Almost inevitably, the people were in the conversation because they had humanities stake too. They wanted to mention their love of Shakespeare, or their, they wanted to, to talk about that class they had in Chinese philosophy when they were in college. You know, there's a, Besides everything else, humanities is the table we can act on. Sit down here and talk about this. Did you read such and such a book? Yes, I did. Okay, let's argue. Um, really, cultural artifacts are partly for that. We formalize that here, um, here uh, at the college level. But I speak to all these practical things. In, in the humanities welcome, I would always remind the students that if they knew how to win an argument with the other, without the other person knowing that they were having an argument, that could be useful for them. Um, and so on, so on. There are various ways to say that. But you know, knowing the book that someone cares about when they mention it. Hello? We're connected. Knowing that someone cares about a particular language and investing somehow in that language, that's a way to connect with them. Um, I think that's what we're doing. I think UCLA without the humanities would be possibly uh, UCLA deprived of a space where it creates its own soul. That's how it goes. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. So one thing I wanted to ask you is, what do you think people learn from the humanities in addition to the specific material that they're studying at that time? Because it seems to me that the humanities, I was a philosophy major here at UCLA, it seems to me that humanities teach you, for one thing, to think deeply, which I think is valuable. But another thing is, we live in this age of iPhones and social media and multitask, and everybody's rushing around frantically, and where did I put my glasses, and where did I put my keys? and um, and not spending much time to reflect, and also, as we're seeing on the news pretty frequently, a time where people hate people who are different from them, people they've never met, but they don't trust them, and they think they don't like them. And it just seems to me that the humanities is an antidote to a lot of this. It teaches you to, to respect differences, to respect people who are different from you, to think deeply, to take time. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I find myself thinking of the phenomenon of ultra-processed food. You, know, right? you, can, you can go to the convenience store and grab yourself a bag of pressure-excluded stuff that provides a certain kind of pleasure, uh, but then immediately demands the next hit. And I, I think that it's possible to talk about that territory in those terms. So you mentioned focus, concentration, and hate. And I do think they're linked concepts. The social media gives us the impression of connection with people, but does not give us enough of the reality of connection with people to take away satisfaction. And, you know, that, that's a terribly simplified way of putting it. But I think as we look at the effects of, of uh, TikTok on young people, we see some of that effect. Sociability without the actual connections. The hatred part, to my mind, is a similar thing. I hope all of us have had the experience of finding our attitudes change during the course of growing up. At that moment when we realized that a person of a group that we had held prejudices against 
was suddenly in our group, and we were suddenly interacting with them, and we could put aside the second kind of stuff. That's, the, that's what I'm talking about, the removes. For me, the hatred comes in at the remove. I can't believe terrible things about the people I'm with and talk with, but I can readily believe it of people two or three removes beyond. That's, a, to, my, to my mind, a terrible phenomenon. One that goes hand in hand with social media, and one that certain kinds of traditional humanistic work will help to break down. Because a fiction, a poem, will in some measure bring that person and their subjectivity into the room with you in a way that social media can't. When I was preparing for this, I wasn't planning to say what I'm about to say, but it would just have, uh, reminds me of an experience I often had in philosophy classes here at UCLA, now going back decades. And that was that a philosophy class would often begin with a professor posing a philosophical question. And my favorite one was determinism versus free will. Can we do what we choose to do, or is it all determined by our heredity, by our genetics? I'm mean, a boy brought up. And when the question was posed, my first reaction was, this is not difficult. We've got 10 weeks. I think I'm going to be able to solve this. But then I got home and was thinking, well, wait a second. Philosophers have been wrestling this way wrestling with this for thousands of years, so maybe I shouldn't be overconfident. But as we went deeper and deeper, I initially thought I knew the answer. As we went deeper, what I almost always found is that I was less sure about my position, and the other side, which I thought was wrong at the beginning, I still didn't really think they were right, but they had some points that I couldn't really refute. And so I was less sure of myself and kind of more accepting of the other side. Yeah, yeah, I love that way of pointing at a specific depth of engagement with the other side of the argument. Uh, something that we tend to deprive ourselves of. Well, I'll speak for myself. If I'm on Twitter, I'm not so much anymore. But if I am, I'm definitely there for the, the nasty dig at the side of the whole political spectrum that I don't like. And there's something fundamentally wrong and entertainment oriented about that habit. We're not talking about something else. We talked, we talked about how that <laughs> ageless kind of um, question about free will and determinism got you as an undergraduate. I think it's very interesting to watch undergraduates get caught up in the things that are lasting themes in our culture because they have to be. When a culture will have its lasting themes, the worry points that it just keeps coming back to that turn out to, to define what that culture is, is worried about and, and what it is in a certain sense. And, you know, that's a good candidate for ours. Yeah. Um. So let me ask you, um, maybe you've already answered this, and if so, we can move on to something else, but is there anything more you'd like to maybe explain about the value of studying languages, cultures, and texts from earlier, earlier eras, kind of the importance of humanities to society? Yeah, lots more. Uh, I, I, I left off with you know, encountering you know, supporters of the university who also want to talk about their humanities uh, uh, lives. Uh, if I'm talking to a group of future lawyers, I can talk with them about how their writing skills will inevitably be improved by every challenge in reading they take on here. So I, I can talk with uh, philosophy students about the refinement of thought and how that's likely to win them cases. If I'm talking with people going into other fields, marketing, well, I can talk about rhetoric. The use of language, the understanding of the rhetorical vulnerabilities on the other side of your conversation, these things are never going to become useless, even as AI steps in to write the papers for our classes. Our students who can still argue their way successfully out of a bad situation will still have benefited most. Um, that's a very technical sort of thing. I, say, I still think all of us face the problem of what to do with our minds for the years when we're going to be alive. It's a significant problem. Um, you know, one way that the question about humanities is posed in a public university is, uh, well, why don't you study X, Y, or Z that's going to deliver you an excellent starting salary the first year out, and then it will, and then it will rise thereafter. Great. You're sure that the salary is what you want now and next year, and you're sure that this is the path you want to take, and you're sure that money is going to be the thing that you're going to measure your success in. Life long? Please. But think twice. Because you may want some other things from your education. You may want some other things to do with your brain along the way. And I think that I see the symptoms of not thinking about that problem all the time. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think um, 
In this series, we have very different people speaking on different topics, but it seems to me there are some themes that run throughout. And so the first one we had was a psychology professor, Alan Castell, speaking last month. He was speaking about the brain and memory, and I'll mention two of the things he said that I think relate to what you're saying. Um, one is Jared Diamond, the famous professor here. Um, as he's getting older, he's been studying what he can do to preserve his brain to protect from Alzheimer's, and he thinks that the single best thing he or any of us can do is learn another language, and he's been trying to learn Italian um, just in recent years. Um, and another thing Alan Castell said is that um, there were a group of people in their 70s who have these, he called them super agers, have memories like people in their 30s, and one thing they had in common, related to I think what you were just saying, is they had jobs where they had to do difficult tasks that were challenging, not really so enjoyable, and as they struggled with that, that seemed to be helping their minds and that was preserving their memory. Okay. That's really useful to know. Yeah, I, I love that evidence about the release that experiment with the language, yeah. Um. <laughs> uh, but let's talk about the purpose of a liberal arts education, obviously the humanities, I think, are the, the core of that. So, I mean, what would you say to somebody who thinks that as you were just saying, that a purpose of a college education is to get a good job, career network, a good starting salary, kind of a ladder into a middle class life. Um, that's, well, I, I might start, depending on the person in the conversation, I might start by saying, wow, it's a very reductive uh, definition of what an education is. Have you genuinely excluded all the other things that an education might be for? And then we we'll move on uh, from there. But you know, I think the way you pose the question is clear, right? So I get a middle class job doesn't quite matter what it might be, make your money and go forward. And you know, it's almost such a common place I would want it for my kids too, who would not want that for their children. And yet, and yet, only well, they move this way. It is possible, of course, for your college education to get so much more than that and still get that. And I think that I meet students all the time doing that. They're, you know, they're here getting the good major that they know they want, the career that they know they want, and then they're taking a bunch of extra courses. I like that, that option at the university. So I'm not sure that's what I would say, but if it's the strong form of the argument, colleges for making money, let's get rid of all those bogus other subjects that don't contribute anything, um, then I'll have, to, I'll have to argue back that what we expect of adults in our society is not uh, the ability to do the things on their job description and nothing else. We expect them to be human beings. And even in the job, the jobs change so much that what you're trained for now may not be that useful 10, 15 years down the road. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for saying so, um, so it's helpful to be able to learn how to kind of problem solve and analyze. Yeah, I mean, to say and work with other people. Uh, I keep getting excited about this thing. Uh, one of, while I was dean, there was a student, Tiffany Zahn, who's an education PhD student, and she did a, a dissertation to, to kind of test the links between humanities study and creativity. And it was very hard, sort of hard to measure creativity. Well, I took a history course and now they're 5% more creative. It wasn't like that, but it was, uh, she was able to tell certain uh, links between humanities classes and encouraging the propensity for creativity. Well, that sounds like hedging, but I still think it's extremely valuable. Right? So in a humanities class and you know, what's going to be valuable is not when you raise your hand and give the factoid that you were memorizing from the reading. It's going to come when you raise your hand and give an interesting interpretation that people haven't thought about before. The propensity for creativity. Talk about adaptability, the changing pace of the world of careers. I think that um, flexibility, adaptability. I want to ask you a couple of questions about the humanities and technology. Is technology influencing the study of ancient languages and cultures here at UCLA and elsewhere? Definitely, yes. Um, of course, the, the courses are offered in more flexible ways. We've got online teaching. That, that's a rather trivial aspect of it. But um, the way that students access knowledge now has changed vastly from when I learned Chinese, for example. When I was learning Chinese starting in 1982, I would use my paper textbook, and then I would go to the language lab a place where I would sit for an hour happily doing my repetition and so forth. Of course, none of that's happening now. All of that happens uh, on the classroom stuff. It still happens in the classroom, but this is the golden era of, of learning languages. There are so many materials uh, online. And I just think it's a richer environment by far than it was before. 
And so what are the benefits and challenges of using technology? Well, I think it become a crutch. Uh, it's a trivial example, but when I was learning Chinese, I had this bizarre ritual of creating my own flashcards. I would cut up a regular piece of copying paper in a certain way and create my flashcards. And I would obsess over them physically. Now, if I need to look up a word, I just go online and look it up. And I'm sure that's what my students do, too. Um, it tends to stick less. But there's a definite trade-off, right? The, the slow method that I used before will get stuff into your brain, a limited amount of stuff, very securely. The quick methods we use now, the methods I use for my research, gather all kinds of information, but it doesn't stick as so much. I think that goes back to the question of concentration, too. What are the digital methods? What are the digital methods? Yeah, I mean, isn't that something that UCLA has? Definitely. Is that a series of programs? Or? Yeah, I've kind of uh, thrown uh, back a question because oh. it's such a huge one. Oh, oh. But, but I think that's I think that's appropriate. I mean, in a general sense, digital humanities would be the digitally aided study of the stuff we've been doing with the humanities here, too. But I thought I come within UCLA, though, there's, the, there's something specifically oh, called yeah. digital humanities. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a small program of digital humanities. We have a number of prominent practitioners, uh, both in the Division of Humanities and elsewhere on campus. So I would mention Tom Prester, especially a real innovator in this area. Um, but it covers all kinds of courses and projects with training students to do some of the coding they need to work with, you know, uh, textual corpora, or uh, some students are working with visual, visual materials. I mean, in my own small way, in my research, I use mean, some digital tools, but it's nothing like what you see the students doing these days. They'll be working with you know, huge amounts of data, and still asking the kinds of questions, the kinds of questions that we would ask, faculty members would ask in our research, but really doing it much more access to information, more powerfully than we'd see elsewhere. So let's talk at least a bit about you now. Um, when and how did you first develop your love for the humanities and for China and early China? Yeah. Well, I was a, quite a reader as a kid, I was a bookworm. But I really fell in love with Chinese uh, when I was 17. Um, and it's a story I've, I've told some people here before, I think, but I was uh, on my way to college. I, I grew up in, in Michigan, Massachusetts. And I was driving across the country to Stanford, where I was going to be a, a freshman. And I was traveling with my best friend, who is still my best friend, uh, my best old friend, Michael, who can speak Spanish very fluently as a second. I really felt jealous of his abilities. I had studied Latin and some things like that, but couldn't really speak with anyone in a, in a second modern language. So we came to this little used bookstore in Canada, and I found a book, Teach Yourself Chinese. Wow. Ha, I said it again. <laughs> Bought it. Wow. And within like two or three days, I, I taught myself that you can't wow. teach yourself Chinese. It's hopeless. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I still have the bookstore. Um, but as soon as I got to college, I, of course, enrolled happily in elementary Chinese. There were all of 20 students in the class that year, which is incredible, given the large enrollments that Mandarin courses saw later. And I was off, and I, I really, that was my thing. It, it was a way of finding identity for me, bizarrely enough, in college. Yeah. And you're interested in very, very early China, right? How do you get interested in that? Uh, well, I, I studied Mandarin. I traveled to Taiwan and lived there for a year as a student, as a teacher of English. And during that time, I started to study classical Chinese. And some of the first things you read, like little passages from the Confucian philosopher, Mencius, that kind of thing. Um, but not too far in, I started reading passages from this historical work that I found, well, way more interesting than any other, anything else I'd read in classical Chinese. And really, I spent much of my career working that exact work. I'm branching out from it a little bit more right now. But, oh, tell us about it. I'm sort of hesitant about boring people with this in case it seems, uh, it seems uh, obscure. I work on something called the Zuldran. It's an analytic history of the central states of what would come to be known as China. It covers the years uh, 722 to 479 BC few extra things here and there. But imagine, this is the thing we do not have for the Greek world, or, uh, or in the Hebrew Bible, or anywhere that I know. Year over year entries. Something for every year about events in these states. 
very often extensive reports of diplomatic meetings, battles, conversations, speeches, it's incredibly rich and difficult and beautiful written text. Uh, so I wrote a book about that and later worked on a collaborative translation of it, which came out. And, yeah. Did Chinese historians and historians elsewhere view history differently in the writing of history? I think so. I think so. In fact, in fact I would say my, my career is based on the idea that, that people write history differently in different ways. And that I'm so aware of being in the presence of at least one historian here today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I set out, I was, a, I was a graduate student in comparative literature. And I think the gumption to be a complex student work on <coughs> early Chinese history, which is this intensely nerdy, philological kind of field where even to this day I feel there are historians who know the facts better. But then I come back and I say, however, there may not be historians who are thinking as carefully about the differences in the way this, way, this story is being told. Zhuang has its very characteristic ways of telling stories, which are different from even closely uh, related texts. To my mind, it's, it's always a fact that the way narratives tell about the past is intentionally or not providing a second nature for the people who are uh, writing the text and then often for people who are reading the text thereafter. So it, for me, it pays to think about Zodron or to think of Chinese historical writing in a comparative setting. And I think that I want to get to your question. I mean, one point that could be made is that mm, for one of the texts I mentioned here, uh, a real way of thinking about the world is in terms of, of ritual propriety and how well we treat each other in well, informal settings like this, in fact. So, you know, imaginable narratives in, in the text that I work on would be we're all sitting here having this meeting of some sort, and then maybe someone out there is holding their jade plaque the wrong way, or is uh, doing something fairly minor in terms of original violation. In this text, someone might show up right at the edge of the scene and say, see, so-and-so has violated the ritual. They're doomed. And then the text will do to make sure that that happens a few years later, that the prediction comes true. So it seems, I mean, this form of narrative seems, among other things, to be disciplining the world in terms of ritual. That's very different from what Herodotus does, well, there's some overlaps, or from what Livy does, and you really start to see those differences once you start to read them against each other. In our discussion later, Dr. Malore might have some comments about this too, but um, I'd like to ask you, how does understanding early Chinese historical writing in early China help us understand Chinese ideas today? Or, or and is that even the goal of your research, or do you want to learn the material for its own sake? and not for what it tells us today. Well, I think I'm much more sympathetic with, with that. And, I mean, I am, I'm drawn into the problems of these texts for their own sake. And the question of how, say, the PRC right now, just to take one example of something, an entity that might be called Chinese, that's a secondary question for me. But there's something that I want to fasten on on this, on this uh, point. You know, a few weeks ago, I wrote, read a quote attributed to uh, the head of the Deng Xiaoping Thought Center at the uh, Center for uh, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. It's the premier institute or place for uh, social scientists, academic social scientists in China. Uh, and the quote was along these lines: "There is one, there is one accurate representation of history." Our job is to get as close to it as we can. It is like a, it is like a still pool. Why would we want to disturb it? Uh, and I should tone it down in quoting it, but I imagine there are I imagine there are some historians out there who hold to that statement in some sort of like the form in which it was made. I imagine there are historians who who regard the project as one of approaching a truth that cannot be reached quite in the stark way that that quote promises, I, I think in this day, going back to the question of whether my work is related to how uh, China now wants to, wants to understand its past, I feel strong with my job at UCLA and as the person I am coming secondarily to classical Chinese and to classical Chinese history, I think my job is to complicate. 
I think my job is to say, you wanted one story? Sorry, there are more obstacles to it. In fact, my current work is, uh, you know, to put it very briefly, people may know about the Shi Ji, it's an important historical work of 100 BC, Sima Qian, wonderful universal history of China to that point. Uh, my current work is to, is to show how that work systematically squashes out alternative stories. That's so interesting. Your job is to complicate rather than to simplify. Yeah. That's yeah. really interesting. I mean, to me, that seems like something that's inherent to the humanities overall. You know, one thing that I've wondered, as a former philosophy major, it seemed to me that so many of the issues that American society faces are issues of moral philosophy. Uh, is abortion right or wrong? When is war right? How much should you tax the poor to help the rich? There are all these questions that capital punishment and euthanasia. There are many, many questions of moral philosophy, and yet you don't have, I think you don't have any moral philosophers that are on CNN and other news programs debating the issues. You don't have them. And I was wondering, why is that? And I think the answer is what you just said, that the, that the philosophers, the humanists, complicate things. People want a simple answer. And you ask the philosopher, what's the answer to this question? And the philosopher says, it's complicated. On the one hand, this. On the other hand, that. And I think there was one president who said he wanted a one-handed advisor, not somebody who'd say, on the one hand, this. On the other. That's a good idea. Yeah, I think, I mean, now you get into it, I think philosophers face in more virulent form the, uh, the same dilemma that a lot of humanists uh, face. I mean, we're professionally employed humanists. You know, we might be in our office doing stylometric analyses of 18th century prose that, you know, just to name one colleague who's since retired. This is the stuff we do, but we go out in public and talk about our stylometric analyses of 18th century prose. We always get through. So, you know, philosophers drawn into the public sphere have to decide whether they now want to be able to, to grapple there. And actually, I think the public sphere has its wonderful sides and has its really destructive sides when it comes to actual yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, George Orwell wrote in 1984 that who controls the past controls the future, and who controls the present controls the past. You studied the very distant past, and I wonder if your work provides any insights into the relations between the past and the present, and even the future. Yeah, well, I like about the, I like about the oh, typical humanist move, problematize the premise. <laughs> Orwell seems to assume there that, uh, that control of some kind is possible. Of course, he's speaking for a state effort at control. Right. The present of the past, the present of the future. Let's admit that, that it's a, a mirage. But <laughs> let's go ahead and acknowledge that over there at the Dung Shopping Center for, uh, sorry, the Center for Dung Shopping Thought, that's the effort. That of course, the, the past is the main thing you would want to, to control from, from many, many positions, perhaps even from ours. And I've got a mistake in controlling what my students believe about uh, the Chinese past, for example, although I, I flatter myself that I'm a little more receptive to variants. No, I, I think that the control is always there. There will always be someone attempting to use the, the Arguing about the past to control the present, yeah, to justify yeah. policies. Our response will always be to do exactly the same thing in, in an effort to break up that control. And um, right, I mean, the past can be used, can be manipulated, right, to, to justify current policies. I mean, the past is both. But it will be the resource for the controlling power. But at the same point, at the same point, anyone else who knows anything about the past will also be able to use it as a way. And in 1984, it's enough to make sure that no one knows anything else about the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe another topic Professor Malora would like to, to talk about a bit later. Kind of the, the, relation between, the relation between history and truth. I remember being struck when I was an undergraduate taking a classics class here, um, learning that Thucydides was really the first historian who brought the idea of kind of factual accuracy. And it wasn't completely accurate, but to bring accuracy, to bring truth, in history, and that before before Thucydides, people who were called historians weren't really trying to do that. Um, I don't know any thoughts about kind of early Chinese historical writing and, and the role of um, truth and accuracy. Or well, I, think reflect, I want to think of, oh, reflect on Thucydides and then move over to the yeah, Chinese. Sure. Then I think Thucydides he introduces a word and a concept for accuracy, kind of unusual, Akridea, 
and it seems to be testing different, different accounts and coming to one that uh, fits the facts. It's not that there wasn't a dedication to reporting true things before him. I mean, his, his immediate predecessor, who personally criticizes most Herodotus, is one who collected many stories. That's one way of getting at the truth. And, and I think, <laughs> you know, for all the incredible respect that we have to hold for other cities, Herodotus' method is not absurd. You know, in fact, I think in my current work, you know, as I try to break down this this hopeful clamping down of the unitary Chinese past, I think I want to say, no, the right way to get at truth is not to say this is exactly what happened. The right way to get at truth is to get at the multiple things that people believed had happened, or at least to include that. Um, and I would say that the city is, is so interested in getting at the truth behind the reports that sometimes it doesn't give us enough of the reports. Does that make, I hope yeah, that decision yeah, makes, yeah. you know, makes sense, right, to report to report a, a very contradictory set of oral histories about an event would be maddening to a true Fasidian, and yet it might be more truthful for everyone who participated. And what about early Chinese historical writing? Yeah. Uh, I think that it's actually really useful to, to read it against that Herodotus Thucydides nexus, because you can see, for instance, in Shuti, this, this work from 100 BC or so, you can see that some of the reports out there, Lovoy, Herodotus would call them, tales about how this or that happened, are entirely unacceptable. They must be excluded from this text. Right? The universal history is also a way of reducing the past to an acceptable version at that point. And that means, that means getting rid of some of those other stories. And, and back to your research, what, what tools do you, do you use in your research? Are you using different tools from what you did years ago? Oh yeah, definitely. We're so fortunate in Chinese in that you can search uh, electronically very, very conveniently. You can search any text that you have digitally. So a very common thing for me to do in my work every day now is to come to a new passage of this historical work that I'm working on and then use the various tools I have to find other reports of the same event and to bring them together. That's the kind of thing that he's done very laboriously in commentaries on Herodotus and the like. Now you can do it very, very quickly. And it, it's a bit like we were talking about with social media before. In contrast to a lifetime spent reading and taking notes on a small set of texts, there's an immense productivity now. Quite quickly, to find everything the early Chinese said about what happened in 478 BC. Um, a little bit of work you can do that. That's really different. That's really different. It means you know you can imagine a sort of very oral version of a text that before would have been read kind of in isolation. Yeah. I wonder if you have much to say about where UCLA stands with the humanities compared to other outstanding universities. Is UCLA especially strong in certain areas? Do we have a, kind of a broader range in numbers? Yeah, I think the first thing that has to be said is that UCLA is incredibly strong in terms of scale. Right? We have 200 plus faculty members within the Division of Humanities. Uh, there are humanistic departments elsewhere in uh, the college that would be counted as part of the humanities as well, most notably history. Those numbers, even though they have declined over the past two decades, are still an immense investment, and an investment that tends to reproduce itself, even against uh, some pressures. So there's, there's that. Um, uh, I, would, I would say that probably the most important way that, that UCLA Humanities has changed in the past years has been because of the campaign. Um, the first, the campaign. The campaign uh, was operated in an interesting way. For people who were in deanships at that point, there had been a process at the campus level to determine what the total goal would be. Yeah, the fundraising campaign, the centennial campaign. Yeah, the centennial campaign. You know, I was newly uh, beginning my job at that time. It was a funny thing to watch. That target was set at the, at the campus level, $4 billion or whatever it was. And then it was, it was um, pieced out according to the proportion that each unit, each division of school was thought to be able to raise. 
And then a staff was created at each division or school to help reach that level. This was new to me by way of uh, strategic planning and so forth, really informative, but it also meant that I started the job with a target, and I started the job with a professional group of development people who built a very strong relationship. And over those years, we created several newly uh, endowed uh, research centers. Uh, we endowed some existing centers. Uh, and what that means is that for future um, humanities deans, for future chancellors and EBCPs, as you think about how to work with the resources of the humanities, you have lasting gifts of endowments that are like ballast. Um, it's ballast that produces continual support for the faculty and for the research students. But I also think of it as rather like a defensive burn around the humanities. This is how the public has invested in us. This is how we're committed to the community around us. And this is how we're going to support the future humanists at UCLA. When you look at the humanities at UCLA, at Stanford, at Berkeley, other great universities, would you say they're pretty similar, pretty different? Is UCLA kind of unique? Or? Yeah, you know, I want to admit that I'm not good at answering that question. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're bigger than uh, Stanford or Harvard in terms of the number of humanities faculty we have which means we can cover more fields, we can diverse, diversify um, with greater numbers of people each year because of larger numbers of, of hires. We have invested, I think one key difference is that here in the Division of Humanities, we've invested a little more in the study of medieval and ancient things than uh, may be happening in some of our counterpart universities. It's partly because of the way that um, we've planned things as departments, it's part of the, mm -hmm. partly about the development opportunities, but I think that's Strengths. And I would, I would mention as well uh, the progress that's being made now in uh, health humanities, one of Dean Stern's new priorities is health humanities, yeah, which is totally suitable for, for UCLA. Um, so I want to hear a little more about your time, your experiences as Dean. Um, did your experiences as Dean of Humanities affect your views on the humanities and higher education? Were there some highlights? Anything that you'd like to single out for your time as Dean? That's a very broad question. It is, yeah. I mean, the, there were highlights, and, and maybe I'll mention some lowlights too. But, I mean, the, the highlights, I, I really enjoyed working to, to build research centers. I'm convinced that that kind of uh, interlocking structure of departments and research centers is a way of strength. So, well, what is going on? Oh, well, uh, the Levy Center got an endowment during this time. The Port of Wood Center was founded. It has recently become the Port of Wood Institute with an additional uh, endowment gift. The Niarcos, uh, <coughs> I've kind of lined up to give the name of the center, is the Stavros Niarcos Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture. That was founded. Um, the Yenai Institute, um, which is a massive institute within the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures for the study of the global Japanese uh, humanities. Wonderful, huge endowment, nice ties with the founder of Uniqlo. So these are these are things that position UCLA globally as well. And all of those centers are also setting up many, many other connections with institutions elsewhere. Um, you know, I think the main highlight is really in any of these positions, you get to see more of the university than you would have otherwise. If you're chairing, suddenly you see the difficulties of the budget and the terrible troubles of your colleagues. If you're being a dean, then suddenly you get to see, I mean, correspondingly wonderful things, you know, the people who've been admitted to the academy, um, you know, the people who've just won a major first sure. prize from a foreign government or something. Uh, and then, yeah, I must say there were many demoralizing things. I mean, my partner is sitting here in the back, and she, we're going to have seen me go through many periods, not exactly depression, but just a foul, ugly mood about, typically about the way people treat each other in some cases. Yeah. Is there any research that you want to highlight? I know there are faculty who have endowed chairs that are very renowned in their work. Uh, I mean, well, I mean, to pick someone out is to, uh, to do an injustice to everyone okay. else. But, oh. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so kind of coming back to the question about the purpose of the university, is there advice you give to um, 
to a student, a graduate student, say, or maybe an undergraduate who loves the humanities but is concerned that maybe getting going in the STEM field is going to be more practical. You know, the jumps are hard to get. Any advice you offer? Yeah, I mean, if it's really posed up by STEM, I think that if you've got the STEM abilities, if you've got the math there, if you've got any doubt about it, then go for it. Why not? And consider the way of the double major. But I think that if you're not quite convinced that STEM is the way forward and you're preparing either for a career that you don't quite know about yet, or you've got a general sense that you might want to do one of the things that can happen after college, MBA or uh, law school, the humanities degrees continue to be excellent ways to prepare the mind for that, uh, to prepare writing skills. I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Kind of training your mind to analyze arguments critical thinking. So, so and I and I do think that language study, uh, as you said, is an excellent way of training the brain. Perfect challenge for everyone. I also emphasize with students that while you can study online, it's nothing, there's nothing like taking yourself, your vulnerable self, your insecure self, and putting it, putting it in a foreign language environment and facing all that comes with it. It's such a challenge, it's such a triumph if you succeed. Do the humanities do they evolve in response to contemporary issues and debates? Should they evolve? Uh, you know, I remember studying Shakespeare and hearing that different generations find something new in the plays that resonate based on what's happening at that particular time. Yeah, I think the things that stick with us generation after generation are um, the other things, things that we can't do without. And when we fail to find new ways to approach Shakespeare, then it will cease to be read. I want to emphasize, I don't really mean that in scholarly terms, though. You know, uh, we can go on teaching Shakespeare and have no fact on whether it actually survives outside of the university. But no, I do think the humanities change. And I think the way that we as faculty continually have little crises about what's changing in the humanities, I think everyone's familiar with the kind of thing where we learn that you know, something's going to be canceled, something's going to be closed, and we wonder, is this the beginning of the end? I think that's the continual state of culture continual state of humanities mm -hmm. divisions. Um, they're going to change, there's going to be pressure to get smaller, in some cases the data is going to be lost. But the fact of change, the fact of having to respond to what the humanities is now, is going to stay with us. Right, so there are universities right now where the humanities seem to be threatened. So specifically, West Virginia University has proposed deep cuts to more than 30 degree programs, including world language and literature which includes Chinese, French, and German. Um, what are your thoughts about universities making cuts, say, while well, students are more interested in STEM, the humanities seem less practical and technological age? And what would you say about kind of defending the humanities? Um, yeah, I mean, it's easy to be a backseat driver. I don't know what their budget situation is. I don't know what uh, other arrangements they might have right. made for their students to access. But it's not only West Virginia. It's not only West Virginia. I think the humanities can kind of be a convenient scapegoat, don't you think? It's a really um, I think that the students come out less prepared. I think they come out with fewer options. And I think the diminished emphasis on these sorts of skills, going back to the beginning of our conversation, the skills that bring us together to talk about either a theme or a work that we deem important, removing that from college means corresponding less preparation for the challenges of citizenship, the challenges of the workplace. You know, I'd like to predict confidently that West Virginia will soon discover that its students are failing on every side and because, I'm joking, but really, you're going to send students out with no more socialization in how they interact with other people than what they get in an engineering sure. Well, at the, at the UCLA commencement ceremonies each year, you give a talk before you confer a degree, and uh, I think you had thoughts about how humanities graduates Differ from science graduates. Yeah, I think. Well, <laughs> or is that more, is that more just kind of fun and <laughs> it, that, That's kind of. I don't know how many people have typically gone to the college commencement, but in the past few years, the, the several colleges, the several deans of the college, have this little competitive thing where, uh, like, like Victoria Sword, when she was doing life sciences, would always point out how 
biologically well adjusted the students were. But there's a long list of benefits for the life science students. And I think for the humanities students, I would say, uh, you know, you're the ones who are curious about the people across the hall and across the street and across the ocean. You know, there's lots of kind of uh, whisperism, but I didn't mean it. I'm doing it. I mean, this is really going back to the beginning of the conversation, right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so before I even introduced you today, I was saying that some states have book bans in high schools. Um, some have made deletions of scenes from Shakespeare that they say are offensive from his plays. And how concerned are you about these kinds of actions? I, you know, uh, three thousand books have been banned this year, more than three thousand. Yeah, I'm, on the one hand, I'm very concerned when people don't get access to knowledge. Uh, their lives remain unchanged and uh, not changed in ways that good books could have changed them. Uh, another part of me thinks, ah, now it's out of you. You would like to impose your religious standards on me, on my children, on my fellow citizens. Here's why I don't regard that as right. And so our society is built on the open exchange of things is that this is indoctrination. Um, reading creates horizons that allow possibilities in lives that otherwise just never appear. Um, I find that's rather, that's rather plain <laughs> stated, but it, yeah. obviously I can't support the terms. I mean, maybe I can turn the question a little bit. What about here in the classroom at UCLA? What, what things can we teach? And what things shouldn't we teach? Sure. What, what can I bring into the classroom while also respecting everyone that's sure. here in the classroom? Oh. With me. And I think that, that's the most that's the most important version of the question. Yeah, debates about the standard Western Civ class that yeah. the graduates take. What book should be part of the canon? Yeah, right. Who and should the canon change? And when? Who decides? Yeah. But I was going in a much more personal way. Here we are again in the classroom. I chose Huckleberry Finn. Mm -hmm. I was like, if you, you, who? I really think, you know, this is our classroom. Our classroom setting is the place where we have these real, officially sanctioned interactions with people. We have to do it around difficult stuff, otherwise it's just tedious. So what do we do when we come to those moments that really bring out the difference between? I think that's what we're after, in a way. Um, I, you know, I think preserving a range of literature, not banning, not trying to normalize, reduce. That's what we'll have to Yeah, no need to delete scenes from Shakespeare. Um, is there much um, collaboration in interdisciplinary work in the humanities? Have you worked with, with others? Have you worked on your own? I mostly work on my own. I'm mostly comfortable working on my own. I, I hold in awe the scientists who run laboratories and have those extra managerial skills that go with that. Um, just, I have done some serious collaborative work. In fact, one of the major publications is project that took 15 or 20 years, a huge three-volume translation of this historical work. And that was one of the true joys of my scholarly life. Even though I don't gravitate to, to, to group work, that thing, like having a difficult text, working through it, disagreeing, arguing it out, and coming to something that represented the way all three of us, you know, we really feel strongly about this text. We really love it. So it was like a, it was just a joy throughout. But that kind of collaborative work is relatively unusual in humanities, unfortunately. Um, would you like to say anything about your current research, what excites you right now? And has it changed during the... Well, what about also the 11 years you were dean? Were you able to do the research? Do you come to it from a different view from where you left off? Yeah, I, do. I definitely come to it in a different way. My research slowed way down. Again, I'm really impressed with uh, people who maintain their labs. Where I sort of did that, and she did. Um, yeah, so I published a few things. That translation came out during those years. But you ask how my how right. my approach may have changed. I'm a fairly solitary person. This job forced me into collaborative work with lots of other people across a huge campus. That was such a joy for me. It was also sometimes very frustrating or didn't come naturally, but mostly it was a true Joy, partly because of the perspective it gave me on UCLA, and partly because, you know, equipped with costume and a role, I was able 
to work with people to try to to achieve the things that we wanted to achieve together. And that turned into a real interest in institutional history. <laughs> Not exactly the, the most predictable outcome from that. But the stuff I'm working on right now turns out to be all about the problems within institutions. It tends to be about fairly small groups of um, high prestige people battling it out, sometimes violently. And, you know, apart from the violence, the... Uh, Some things never change. <laughs> right? You know, the, the, experience, the experience of being in rooms where difficult decisions are being taken, trying somehow to, to work with that structure, has been informative for reading historical works as well. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, we'd like to hear from you now. Uh, we'd like to start us off. You're pointing at me? <laughs> if you like, I've called you a couple of times. Yeah, you, you've been pointing at me. Uh, I'm on the law, because in history. Um, they've been pointing at me, and they expect me to talk about history. You don't have um, to, but you could. I'm going to tell another story, which I think is useful for us to frame things. When I was 16 years old, I studied Homer for the first time. Read the Jesuits had to read. And I was in a Greek class with Anthony Fauci. Wow. And Tony then went off to a college, another Jesuit college, where he majored in classics and philosophy and did a minor in pre med. Okay. So all these years later, when he's become either a demon or a superstar, it's not that that I associated with our education. But during the 1990s, when he became, first he was denounced and burnt in effigy, and then he was glorified as the person who really took on the whole AIDS epidemic. Remember? Yes, uh, yes. One of the 100 points of light of that from George that pushed but AIDS epidemic. And the fact that he went from being vilified to becoming the people who were on the whole AIDS act up thing, made him into a hero. He was the first person who listened to them. He was the first person to bring some of the AIDS sufferers into the conversations about what is to be done. And when I think of Tony, who I haven't seen in years, but um, I think of that as something that those who were teaching us back there at Regis High School would be most proud of that he somehow, this did not come out of going to Harvard Medical School necessarily, but I think it came out of having a certain humanistic attitude. So That's very people. interesting. Yeah. And, uh, and so when I would talk to a young person, my grandchildren, you know, young people who listen to me, <laughs> uh, these are the kinds of things that people get from the humanities whether it's in high school, whether it's in college, studying about other people and how their lives worked and how to understand them, uh, it can have enormously useful impacts in their, not only their lives as humans, but in their careers as well. So that's a personal anecdote that has nothing to do with extra history. No, but I want to, add, add, I want to pick up on that and add something. And some, this is kind of in the area of health humanities. You ask, you know, what would we say to undergraduates who are maybe headed toward, you know, nowadays you professionalize early, um, and take the time for the exercise. What would you say to, to the pre-med about the importance of some engagement with the humanities? And I think, I think in your answer is implicit another possibility here, and that's you're going to need it. You know, you're going out into the world. Go ahead, make tons of money in your chosen career. You're going to need some resources. Or when things don't go well, I'm afraid that um, your econ major may not be able to help you with that. Your pre-med may not help you. Um, one conversation I'm remembering right now is with a resident at um, UCLA Health, and we're talking also about the heavy burden on healthcare professionals who can suffer from various forms of guilt, understanding of responsibility, you know, the immense pressures. One of the functions of the humanities in my book is to help you learn how to think your way through those kinds of pressures. Yeah. Yes. So, 
in my personal experience, I think that I'm a physician, a professor of medicine, and I think one of the most important things I ever did to be an effective physician was to study the humanities, because it just gives you compassion. You need to be thick, you need to very thin, you need Faulkner, and I don't think that, even if you go into the sciences, I don't think you can be as effective if you don't have compassion. And I think, for me, studying the humanities is just a great opportunity to delve into that. And I think that helped me every day in my practice. And I kind of hear in that the possibility of uh, combining the passion for other people, understanding other people, and the crucial thing one sometimes means compassion for oneself. Um, again, I'm thinking about the stressful careers of people, not just people in other fields, and what resources one has then, not only for the compassion for other people, yeah. That's wonderful. Yes. Um, to start with a personal anecdote, I can remember coming to UCLA thinking I was going to be a scientist and sitting in a history class and thinking, wait a minute, you can think in history? I literally have never been asked to think in any history class. But that brings up the issue of you are concerned about shrinkage of the humanities and history, especially as am I at a lower level. So. I taught middle school for a long time. What, if anything, is being done to try to create a pipeline of demand for humanities at the pre-college level? I think it's a kind of a, that can be a double-edged or counterproductive uh, uh, strategy in the sense of, there's a, there's a bumper sticker in, in lot five that I always see. Says reading is sexy, and oh, I do believe reading is sexy. No question about it. But I'm, I'm wondering whether the reading is sexy bumper sticker achieves its goal of making reading sexy for other people. Uh, I, the the pipeline idea. I do think high school students need plenty of humanities uh, exposure too. The pipeline can only happen if they get here and say, I want more humanities. Yeah. I mean, a very practical aspect of that. I mean, it's such an interesting thing. Very practical aspect of that for me was the question of whether we would ever make special spaces for admitting declared humanities students. One way to change how people are majoring in AC would be to say, oh, hey, all of you who declare humanities, come right in. So far as I know, it's never. It's never Some people think a good way to get young people to read a book is to ban it and tell them they're not allowed to. That might say, kind of, their verses never would have been a bestseller if it hadn't been banned. Well said. <laughs> My name is Kim Kokchiao, I'm a professor emeritus of English. I want to, I'm here because uh, to thank David, to thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, I have so many things to thank uh, David. But first of all, I'd like to make a nod to run the law to you and to thank you. your three disciplines. Thank you. Uh, I did my MA thesis on Homer. Okay. Oh. <laughs> and I did my dissertation on Kierkegaard and oh. Shakespeare. Congratulations. And, <laughs> okay. and I love everything. I have taught, and I mean, if you look at me, my CV, my career is very checkered. I was a science major in Hong Kong, okay? I was a science major, my dad wanted me to be in medicine, but, you know, coming to the U.S. is a liberal art. So all of a sudden, I became a big a valedictorian from being like a really struggling student. So I think humanities really saved my life. That's wonderful. And I really don't believe that there is humanity without humanity. That's beautiful. And it's not separate, it's not a discipline in energies. It's we have to make it part of our life. And my life is the happiest at this point. I'm not afraid of getting old. Unlike all my colleagues, uh, I, I went to camp, so all my all these MBA, all these brilliant scientists, they feel so depressed, retiring. They feel that oh we cannot catch up. Whereas me, I just feel I'm I'm more knowledgeable today than ever. And I'm learning Korean, I'm learning uh, Spanish from scratch. <laughs> Congratulations. But knowing That's... French really helps you learn Spanish. Knowing Cantonese really helps with Korean. So I also really believe in humanities building on one another. So now back to David. So I was a UC Education Abroad Director in China uh, for three years in Beijing and two years in Shanghai. So when I came back from Shanghai, that's exactly when David came in as dean. I've never gone to speak with dean, unless they summoned me, but I've never <laughs> volunteered to say, make an appointment. I was very afraid of chairs and deans. Um, 
Back when I was the only Asian in the entire English department, and when I'm the only woman of color in the man, entire managing division for seven years. Okay, so I, I, I'm I'm the change in the block. So excuse my French, but um, so that's because I was learning Tai Chi in China, and I benefited so much. And all my teachers did not the best teachers, the bad teachers. <laughs> It's expensive, but all the best teacher, including one who's like 95 years old, taught every day at the uh, in Beijing. So I said, what can I do? And one group called College Tai Chi, you know, I, I, I took classes with the students at Fudan. I said, what can I do to give back to you guys? You know, all these free lessons. So teach others. So given that I'm like a uh, not a couch potato, but a couch book world like you, and very solitary. I said, I, I'm not good, I'm not gifted in this at all, but I would love to bring it to you, CLA. So I walk into his office and make two really preposterous things that have nothing to do with the English professor. So I said, I would really, but at the time, um, David is trying to connect the North and South campus. So I picked on that. Also, your question, you know, how do you get North and South campus? So I asked, you know, I'd really you know, like to connect North and South Campus through Tai Chi. And I thought he would just laugh. And, but no, he introduced me to East West Medicine, he introduced me to people in world art and culture. Okay, nothing materialized too well at that time because everyone was so territorial. East West Medicine said we already have a Tai Chi master. And we don't want to, you know, I'm not into teaching to East-West medicine or to world art and culture, but to the entire PCLA community. And guess what? I finally did it. Not through any of the people you introduced me to, but getting the network was very, very useful. And then I started it with three ducks. So I taught it last year, and the course is called uh, lit lit literary and martial arts, unexpected humanities. Unexpected affinities, okay. But this year is much better. And I got a big grant for that. Because this year is called Tai Chi and Intersectional Environmentalism. This is the UCLB comic book. I love it, and I urge all of you to pick up a copy before you leave. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Um, and I just feel Tai Chi. I think we're gonna, we'll take a couple more questions. So, Congratulations. So, I thank want you. to thank you for making that possible. Thank you, Judy. Yeah. For me, I think what you said about when things aren't going right in your life, mm -hmm. you know, it's making meaning out of life. And, and I tie that back to what I do as a volunteer, which is I'm a docent at the LA County Museum. I have been for many years. And what we do is we try and bring students in or adults into the into the museum and open them up to make we make meaning together as a community. And that's in a nutshell, I think, what humanities does. And I think it just confirms everything that I'm doing when I'm a docent. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, thank you for that because I think that's that's it, right? There you are in front of the work and that the connection happens as, as all of you perceive it together. Um, I see Bob's, I see your hand as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I'm um, Robert Kirschner, and I uh, was professor of Dutch and Malakans in what was a Germanic languages department. And uh, I think that the humanities department didn't live up to its promise as a humanities, as humanities. Because of all kinds of political stuff. I was in a department which aimed to teach the languages I taught, Dutch and sister language Afrikaans. But the only important language was German. And uh, it took a while for them to pay, pay some attention to. I mean, if you, if you go to, you can go to Holland, I watch people do it and speak German, which is sort of like going to Spain and speaking Portuguese sort of hoping you'll make it. You'll not, and uh, you won't, and people never really opened up. Oh, oh, okay. I'm also weird enough to be
be in, you know, to be in the language department and to actually be interested in language, not in Thomas Mann's sexuality, but in language, not these things that are fashionable. And finally, I would get some students in the linguistic department. Well, students in the linguistics department and applied linguistics department who didn't want to be Chomsky. There are other ways of studying language than gender and grammar. And uh, then I could talk to them. You know. but it's, it's interesting to point out to people that even though you have closely related languages, they can be very different. Like Dutch is closely related to English. But God help you if you don't learn all the things that the textbooks don't talk about. Like little, in Dutch you don't say close the door. You say effectively, please just for a minute close the door. With those little words in there, if you leave them out, you sound like Hitler. <laughs> and it's good for people to be exposed to actually thinking about language in a language department. And I think we need more of that. And I'm not sure, I, I uh, recently spoke to one of the former staff members of my old department, and she says, uh, Carrie Ellen, and she says that the linguistics is, my department is now in the Department of Europe in Languages and Transcultural Studies, with absolutely no linguistic courses whatsoever. And I think that is a huge mistake, but this is probably of being a voice calling out the wilderness. Thank you all. Uh, Bob and I had versions of this discussion uh, over the years, and you know, in, in some fundamental ways, I think I agree. A great university should be offering a diversity of languages. Germanic is not the same as German. But here's the part where I'm just going to become the dean again. <laughs> I'm an ex-dean. I'm definitely an ex-dean here. <laughs> the, I think it works this way. You know, I think we have a proud set of languages that we're offering. Dutch and Afrikaans are not as prominent in that group as they should be and as I have, as I have been. But the fact that we're maintaining the number of languages that we're maintaining means that we've got this general commitment and space for, yes, the now changed department to go back into linguistics. And I, I hold out a promising sign, Spanish, oh, sorry, Spanish and Portuguese Department of, of Literature has had linguists in the past, wonderful linguists um, in an earlier generation. They've now recently hired new linguists. And I think that can happen with other departments too. My own department, Asian Languages and Cultures, also a literature department, biology department, but what's happened over these years is the growth of interest in language. So I feel like maybe we're in one of these kinds of, okay. yeah, uh, uh, cycles. Excuse me, but yes. I thought I had to be the official party. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we're just about out of time, but is there a final question? Yeah. Well, I'm curious, and this is, I'm just thinking out loud, we all seem to be very convinced of the value of humanities, and yet it's not so self-evident in the culture. So is it our culture, or is it true of most cultures around the world? That's a great question. question. Yeah, I, well, I'll give you an answer, but I, I really, since you know, in the spirit of humanity's discussion, please come back to me, because I love the, I love the questioning of the, uh, the accepted truth of humanity. Here's how I want to try to come back. Well, yeah, humanities isn't doing well if you, if you look at Dutch, you can see like, just for the example, or, or maybe it's clear, you know, they're not necessarily teaching that either. There are ways to find chips in the university representation of humanities. But we can look over here, where Taylor Swift has just brought in however many billion dollars, uh, and so forth and so on. I think that when we define humanities just as what the university is doing, we do ourselves a couple of disservices. We focus on the thing that academics tend to be pessimistic about, the world's ending again, just as it was last year. Um, but we also discount the massive amount of hugely important humanities, humanities, the lowercase work that's going out, going on out in the real, the real non-academic world, the popular world, the culture. And I think that area is very healthy. How do we count that to our good? How do we harness that? 
that energy. Watching the students' actual humanities lives is so fascinating. You know, here they go along in cosplay, or they're on their way to their club to make a, a Macedonian war armor thing, whatever. I mean, they have amazingly diverse things that, that lie outside the actual territory of the class. So maybe an answer or a thought from this setting is we constantly have to be catching up where to where they're doing their humanities thinking so that, so that we can enforce the wonders of reading to him there. But, but I did invite you to come back. I mean, was that a, is that a, a Dr. Scottberg, you've given us many, many wonderful answers here. Please join me in thanking Dr. Scottberg. Thank you.